Uh, okay, first of all, Torsten, don't go away before I thank you. He is the man who changed my view of the cello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy they chose you to play this morning. Hello. Oh, you can start. I can hardly believe that a year has passed since I stepped into this stage to share my thoughts with you. Last year's CA was my Christmas gift, received four months earlier and wrapped in a colorful, beautiful paper made out of your faces and your kindness and your talent. When I realized that I had been invited to be here again, I felt that my cup had overflooded. Being a Christian, I couldn't help singing a few, thank you, thank you, thank you. Some of them sounded too much enthusiastic. In fact, I was in my office and one of the teenagers I work with heard me and said to her friends, ooh, now she has started talking to herself. And then she turned to me and said, you are really getting gold, you know. Yes, I know I'm getting gold, and I have to admit that doesn't bother me at all. But I've always enjoyed thinking about time and the influence it has on the way we live. Today, because of all the information we have to deal with, events seem to have happened yesterday and at the same time a long time ago. This speed duality has serious effects on the day on the way we deal with reality not allowing us to stay in the situations long enough to reflect about them evaluating the past enjoying the present and preparing the future so this year we are called to build strategies for a better future but at the same time, reality changes so fast that our thinking soon becomes out of date and obsolete. Why do I bring this subject here? Because the truth is that concerning our world, some of the statements we took for granted just one year ago are now under severe risk of falling apart. Let me give you three random but significant examples. First example, Turkey. We all have watched the daily images of the conflicts in this country. A meeting point of cultures and geography, the birthplace of a concept that many considered revolutionary, an Islamic democracy. In the last couple of years, Turkey had been on the news as an example of what could happen to the economy if only governments were strong enough. It was called the Turkish economic miracle. With decrease of unemployment rates and new structures rising all over the country. But the Turkish miracle couldn't prevent the conflicts at Taksim Square. We can take several conclusions out of this situation, but one of them is for certain that a growing economy is not necessarily a sign of a better life. And worse, that sometimes the price to pay is very high. In Turkey, price was freedom. When Turks protest in the streets, they are saying that as people, they are much more than what money can buy. When Turks protest in the streets, they are saying that you cannot live on bread alone. The second example comes from Brazil, and it is almost the opposite of what I've been saying about Turkey. 
I don't know if the same thing happens in, the, in your countries, but in Portugal, many of us have the idea that football and samba are everything that Brazilians care about. Undoubtedly, Brazil has some of the greatest music, musicians and football players in the world, and those who can understand Portuguese have the privilege of listening to the best lyrics ever written. But the recent protests showed that football and carnival are not enough. We can't live on bread alone, but we definitely need bread to live. Many years of political corruption and economical exploitation led this wonderful country to a situation of misery and deep social contrasts. As I saw in a recent cartoon in Facebook, a man says to his wife, this was a Brazilian cartoon, a man says to his wife, we should go out in the streets to protest. And the wife replies, don't be ridiculous, we already live in the streets. The entire world was expecting Brazil to anticipate all the great sport events with a light, amused attitude. But Brazilians surprised everybody with a distinctive cry of, enough. We don't want new stadiums. We want to feed our children. Finally, let's talk about Europe. In only 12 months, the tensions between some state members of the European Union increased, leaving no doubt to the fact that Jean Monnet's utopia is a hard way to walk. It also became clearer that when we talk about Europe, in fact, we are talking about three different Europes, which historical pathway was not considered. A Protestant-inspired Europe, more connected with Anglo-Saxon and Northern countries. A Catholic-inspired Europe, more connected with Latin countries. And an Orthodox-inspired Europe, more connected with the East. When I talk about the sources of inspiration, obviously I'm not talking about only about religious practices, you understand me, but about a set of beliefs and practices that influence our daily life and the choices we make. I'm talking about culture. One of the biggest problems, in my opinion, on the European dialogue is that sometimes when the three Europes meet, they seem to be saying the same thing but in fact, what goes on in their minds can be quite different. And the interpretation of the decisions taken can lead to very diverse results. And when we talk about the role of the trade unions, and sometimes we talk about that here, for example, similarities are very hard to find. In countries like Portugal, for instance, trade unions became the most conservative forces in society, not in a political sense, but in the extreme difficulty to understand and respond to the changes and challenges of contemporary times. They represent themselves and their cooperative interests in a close, identification with political parties instead of being the voice of the workers. The economic crisis brought up some of our fragilities, strengthening of regionalisms, a deeper gap between North and South, and a worrying increase of the idea that immigrants are strongly responsible for the rates of unemployment. In Portugal, we have a saying that I will try to translate to you. It says, if there is no bread in the house, 
everybody quarrels, and yet nobody is right. But not all news are bad news. We have watched a wonderful blooming of solidarity, especially in the southern countries that didn't have a great tradition on initiatives coming from civil society or on social involvement. Every day and everywhere, people from all ages, cultural levels or social conditions feel the urge to create events to raise money, not only to help the poor, but also the elderly, the handicapped, the discriminated, and the victims of injustice. A new conscience of personal responsibility has emerged, giving new meaning to the words of President Kennedy. We are no longer asking what can we do for our countries. We are asking what can we do for our neighbors. Today, we will look outside our backyard if there is one thing I've learned with the present crisis is that no matter how effective a government may be, responses to social needs are always far from what they should be. Again, reality varies from country to country, and I suppose that all of us would be surprised with the diversity of needs that we would meet if we sat down for a while just talking to one another. We would also realize that we all have something to spare and share. But we will come to this later. For the moment, we will take a look around us and try to identify the diversity of people that characterizes European labor market today. Young people becoming financially independent later than ever. Older people retiring later than 30 years ago. People from different parts of the world changing the social landscape. Countries that had an immigrant tradition and now became welcoming places for foreigners and vice versa. Outside our backyard, we have to deal not only with our values, but also with other people's values in a climate of permanent change. So, using Gandhi's words, how can we be part of the change we want to see? Let's take a look at a video. Most of you are too young to recognize the song. In fact, yesterday I realized that this is a piece of classical music, but it is a good starting point for the thoughts I would like to share. And if you want, I really would like you to sing along if you know the song, because I'm sure you'll make a wonderful choir. Could you pass the video, please? We have Beethoven, Mozart, so on, so on, so on. And finally, we have John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Feel free to sing, OK? Losing my hair many years from now. Will you still be sending me a Valentine? Birthday greetings, bottle of wine. If I'd been out till quarter to three, would you lock the door? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? You be older too. And if you say the word, I could stay with you. I could be handing, mending a fuse when your lights have gone. 
You can night a sweat by the fireside. Sunday mornings go for a ride. Digging the garden, digging the weeds. Who could ask for more? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Every summer we can rent it, go to change the eyes look white if it's not too dear. We shall scream and sing, grandchildren on your knees, Vera, Chuck, and Dave. Send me a postcard, drop me a line, stating points of view. Indicate precisely what you mean to say You're sincerely wasting away Give your answer, fill in a form Mine forevermore Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm 64 This song reflects in a very simple way which used to be the expectations most people had, regardless their profession or condition. A lasting loving marriage, financial security, significant relationships with the rest of the family, and the general sense of security and serenity which comes from the assumption that results will depend automatically on the choices we make and decisions we take. One plus one makes two, end of the story. It would be an interesting exercise to rewrite this song according to the expectations we have today in all those fields. In Portugal, over 50% of the marriages end up in divorce. The expression new families became very popular and defines an enormous variety of forms of living together. People used to retire when they were 60 to 65 years old, but because of social security bankruptcy, it will probably be delayed until workers are 67 or even 70 years old. Families that saved for years have lost everything because they had to use the money to pay the bills or to help their own children. Many adults that had put their parents in retirement homes are now taking them back home, but not because they want to be with them, but because this way they can use the retirement pensions to survive. People tend to live one day at a time because it is easier to manage the tension this way. In today's mathematics, one plus one makes, we'll see. So, welcome to the present. Let me share, this is the present. Let me share with you a text that I thought it was very interesting. The text, please. <laughs> Thank you. Can you read uh, the words? It says, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflicts abound. The law is paralyzed and justice never seems to prevail. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Why do you tolerate treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves. 
The wealthy pull the righteous up with hooks and catch them in their nets. They gather them up in their dragnets, and so they rejoice and feel glad. Do you recognize this scenario? When we look at present reality, the most disturbing feeling comes from the sense of injustice. It seems that nobody cares about what is going on. So many things that need to be changed. Now, the author of this text was a man called Habakkuk that lived 600 years before Christ in a society that had nothing to be proud of. In fact, his people was very depressed because all the things they had taken for granted had disappeared and even the God they trusted seemed to have forgotten them. Finally, they concluded that maybe it was better to do the things wrong because obviously the wicked ones were rewarded. Now, if you keep reading the text, you will see that Habakkuk was only considering what he could see for the moment, right in front of him. When God answered him, he gave him a vision of the future, showing him that prosperity of those who practice evil was only temporary. The text ends with one of the most beautiful poems ever written in antiquity, with Habakkuk sharing the strategy he decided to adopt for his own life. Habakkuk is my favorite book on the Bible. If there is one thing I've learned from reading it, it is that things like wealth or fame are transitory. And if there is one thing I have learned from people who have dedicated their lives to serve the others, is that their legacy is everlasting and the effects extend themselves to a point no one can imagine or control. Welcome to the future. Oh, sorry. When we look at the present, I believe we should ask ourselves, what will be my legacy? Welcome to the future. Although none of us, our economists, by the way, they are not God, have any idea on what the future of Europe will be like, there is one thing we all can know for sure. It will never be the same again. Severe crises have the strange and amazing ability of carrying in themselves the seeds of changing, which are indispensable to development. When I say this, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the suffering and uncertainty that, I, that most Ur Europeans have been through is a good thing. I'm saying that I believe that people were created under the image of God, independently of their spiritual beliefs, and therefore have the capacity of restoring themselves from the ashes and turn difficult times into something positive. We can say that in this new disorder, solidarity among people will play perhaps the most important role of all. It became clear for everybody that asymmetries, even within Europe, are too strong to be ignored, and that even inside each country, wealthy or well-organized as it may be, the state or the laws will never cover all the needs, or at least the proper way those needs are fulfilled. In a country like Portugal, with a large majority of old people, most of them with very low retirement pensions, 
almost 50% receive 240 euros a month. And they have to pay for everything with that money, including medicines. Recently, I visited an old man that receives 40 euros a month and has to live with it. But as I was saying, in a country like Portugal, with all these problems, when inquiries ask old, disabled, or retired people about their major problem, the answer that comes in first is not poverty, is loneliness. As Mother Teresa of Calcutta once said, we have drugs to cure people that suffer from such terrible diseases as leprosy, but they don't cure the main problem, the, the disease of feeling unwanted. You can't make a law forbidding loneliness or saying that people have to care about one another. These things come from the heart. They represent an attitude that in order to change society has to be cultivated intensively until it becomes a natural part of daily lives. It starts inside us, but it can be spread outside our backyard. So when we think about the blocks that can help building a new strategy for Europe, we must remember that some of them will have to be made out of new materials because the old ones don't function any longer and never will. Materials that will not work. You call this a dump, right? Yeah. So, materials that will not work. And we'll take a look at three different materials. First, financial logic. Can you see it? It says financial logic. <laughs> And you have two symbols of money shaking hands. The first material that has been used in the building of European community and proved to be absolutely disastrous is the financial logic, which is to say that the wealth or the production, production capacity of the countries should determine the level of intervention they have in political, economical, and social decisions. I know this is a delicate matter. But when we look around us, we can see how dangerous it is to evaluate a country based on the ability to produce money. How many of you are familiar with La Fontaine's fable, The Buzzer and the Ant? She lives in France, and he lives in Romania, and the Portuguese, well. The Buzzer spent the entire summer singing while the ant worked hard to stock food so it would have enough to eat in the winter. When cold finally came, the buzzard knocked at the ant's door and asked the ant to share some food with it. The ant answered, don't even think about it. You spent the whole summer singing, didn't you? Well, now you can dance. Although the purpose of the fable is to teach children the value about the value of work, I always thought it was a horrible story. Even when I was a little girl, I kept imagining, imagining the poor buzzard out in the snow, so probably they were not Portuguese, I don't know where they would get the snow. But anyway, I always imagined 
the poor buzzer out in the snow, starving to death. And I hated the ant for being so cruel. And I distinctively remember thinking, I'm sure that the ant worked so much better because she could hear the buzzer singing. Anna Claire, you can come and sing into my work, okay? <laughs> we all need each other. If we keep using money as the cornerstone of European building, two things will happen. First, when money fails, the entire building will fail. And that's what happened. Secondly, the poorest countries will always be in a position of submission to the rich ones. They will never have arguments that will allow them to dialogue with their peers in an equal democratic way. Second material that will not work, religious logic. History and religion have always walked hand in hand as far as mankind started to organize itself and realize that it contained the essence of the divine. Religion is the most important contribution to the building of a certain culture, both in a positive and in a negative way. The worst acts in the history of mankind were made in, ma in name of God, any God. It's a minefield. No matter what you say about this subject, we will always feel that too much has been said, and yet something is missing. As Western society becomes more and more mingled, the danger of using religious arguments increases. Even in the political agenda, the religious background of the European countries is considered. Personally, I think it should, but not to create walls or feed prejudices, but to contribute to the enrichment of dialogue and understanding. And finally, third material to be avoided, information logic. There is social media and things like that, video, television, blah, 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 communications, websites. It was very difficult for me to put into words what I mean by information logic. Finally, I remembered an interesting icebreaker that it, it was used here last year at CA in one of the leaders' meetings. People were asked to write down how many European artists they knew that didn't come from an Anglo-Saxon background. It wasn't very easy, you know. And I must confess that apart from the Latin artists and some Scandinavian, I remember Abba, I could only mention Bella Bartok. What I'm trying to say is that we live in a world where English and American culture dominate the media. I'm very grateful to all the richness that they brought to our lives, but it's time to fight for a more democratic spreading of cultural values. When I hear that expression, uh, especially during the Grammy Awards, musics of the world, I always think, does the rest of the music come from outer space? <laughs> what does this mean, musics of the world? Another example. I am sure that Portuguese invented the word procrastination, which is the ability of leaving everything that needs to be done to the last minute. <laughs> I'm not very proud of this, you know. 
I would be very happy if one of CA organizers would come to my house for a month. Mahil. <laughs> but I have to admit, Portuguese are amazing when something suddenly fails. It may be the electric system or the singer that didn't show up in the last minute. We always come up with a great idea that saves the day. We must create opportunities to know one another better, to do things together, and to share that information with the world. Building materials. On the other hand, there are three materials that are vividly advised to build solid, long-lasting blocks to be used in building in a building that will make us all proud of. First material, a broad vision. Let me tell you, my town, it's just outside here. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's also 40 degrees. <laughs> so the first material is a broad vision. Before we start building blocks, I suggest that we all pick up some fine wood to build a ladder that will allow us to see outside the walls of our backyard. This is the kind of reflection that me and my friends often make when we talk about the hard times that we're living. No matter how difficult our lives may be these days, we're still part of a privileged minority that, just for starting, has the freedom to complain or even think aloud. Remember the Arabic proverb? It says, I used to complain because I didn't have shoes until I saw a beggar that didn't have feet. Now, don't get me wrong, please. I'm not saying that our problems are not important or deserve attention. I'm just saying that if we pay attention to the problems that the majority of mankind has to face, we will look at our own from a different perspective. We'll feel blessed and become more effective on creating solutions for our needs. We can't go on building our well-being at the cost of other countries' poverty. And like it or not, that's the way Western society has been living for the past centuries. As Richard Foster wrote, we can compare ourselves with those who have more than we do or with those who have less than we do. It's our choice. For me, the broadening of our view is the cornerstone of the new solidarity and the better way to understand where should we put our blocks. The second material is inclusion. Let me share something very personal with you. I hope you will forgive me. I have a 24-year-old daughter that suffers from severe cerebral palsy. Her, girl, her global development corresponds to a two-month-old baby, and she is the heroine of a wonderful journey of love and courage. She taught me that our greatest resource is to love and to be loved. But today, I want to describe to you her last birthday party in April. In our living room, we had around 40 guests from three races, seven countries, and four continents. 
The oldest one was 88 years old, and the youngest was only 18 months. There were several PhDs and people that could hardly write their names. Some of those people have never felt the effect of economic crisis in their lives. But on the other hand, at least two of them depend on social support for food. There were three sexual options, four football clubs, this means a lot in Portugal, and five different types of looking at the word God. Three handicapped people. There were fat people, thin people, pretty and ugly people, at least depending on, on the point of view. <laughs> at Anna's party, nobody cared about the differences or the difficulties of communication. Everybody was focused in celebrating the life of someone that, because of being so different, spent the last 24 years teaching the true meaning of inclusion. In a society where the mixture of people is here to stay, we must understand that the acceptance of diversity enriches everybody and is a source of de of de oh development is a source of development a society that does not include is a society that does not grow if anything it will, it may go like a balloon but will not grow. How do we accept diversity? Remember the story of the Beauty and the Beast? Disney version, not Disney version. Okay. The Beauty had to know the Beast closely and fall in love with him. And only then, afterwards, she could see the prince that lived inside. The same happens with inclusion. We have to break our personal bar barriers, take the risk of exposing ourselves, accept the fact that we need diversity to become better persons so we can be enriched. And the last material, sharing. I love this picture. Heat and flowers. Sharing, well. I always thought of myself as someone who enjoyed sharing. I grew up in a middle class family and realized very early that I was part of a privileged minority and I could access things that others could only dream of. Every Christmas, I had to give a substantial part of my toys to the children at the orphanage. And my parents were wise enough to explain to me that giving was only the beginning of sharing. So things seemed to run smoothly in this area until the day I was hit by the first sentence that philosopher Francis Schaeffer had written in an article. He, he wrote, when was the last time you run the risk of having a drunken person throwing up on your living room carpet? When was the last time you run the risk of having a drunken person throwing up on your living room carpet? I felt run over by these words. <laughs> My parents were right. It is easy to share if it is only a question of giving our leftovers, the things we don't need. It is 
easy to walk the mile with the enemy when the enemy orders us to walk. But if we want to be part of the change we want to see, sooner or later will come a time when the real question won't be what can we do for one another, but what are we willing to give up so others can have what they need? A time when we decide to walk another mile so our enemy will not feel lonely. In conclusion, can you see the measuring tape uh, behind the word love? Well, there's a measuring tape. All human beings are human resources, and we all need each other. And the truth is that all of us are building blocks. Even when we adopt a passive attitude towards life, or in other words, towards our neighbors. The final question is, what use will we give to those blocks? We can use them to build walls that will give us the false impression of security against uncertainty. We can use them to build towers that will put us so selfishly high that we will no longer understand reality around us and become poor of spirit and not in a good way. We can use them to build dry wells that will keep us in a permanent attitude of self-pity and commiseration. Or we can give them the best use of all, to build bridges that will allow us to enrich each other's lives. Quoting Philip Yancey, love can only be exercised from one person to another. The great Western societies are getting further and further from the essential belief in the value of the human soul. We tend to see history as if it is made of groups of people, social classes, political parties, races, social groups. We apply labels to one another, explain behaviors, and attribute values based on those labels. We look at mankind problems from a mathematical point of view, rate of gross national product, income per capita, mortality rates, how many doctors for a thousand inhabitants, etc., etc. Love, however, is not mathematical. We will never be able to calculate precisely how much good should be applied equally to all the poor and needy of the world. The only thing we can do is to reach one person, then another, and another, and another, as objects of God's love. We can't put a measure on love. We can only be in the disposition of showing it until it is enough. I believe that art, all forms of art, has the incomparable capacity of bringing people together, of reaching others with a unique message that knows no boundaries. The universal language of art can play a precious role in the new forms of solidarity that our society needs. Let me give you a final example. For years, diamond traffic in Sierra Leone was responsible for the death, torture, and misery of thousands of people, including hundreds of children. A living hell that was maintained in secret by international agenda. But in 2006, Edward Zwick directed a movie called Blood Diamonds with Leonardo DiCaprio as lead actor. 
Now, we can say a lot about Hollywood machine, but we cannot underestimate the capacity they have to reach a lot of people. And the truth is that DiCaprio's pretty face did for the people of Sierra Leone what the United Nations had never done. The world woke up to that terrible reality and the first steps were taken to save that people. We don't have to be DiCaprio and we don't need Hollywood's machine to be part of the change we want to see. We just need to build our block, sign it, and deliver it in the nearest bridge. Thank you for your kind attention. God bless you.